Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Jack Turco, and I'm director of the health service. Uh, anybody ever notice how note cards are getting smaller? As I mature, they get smaller and smaller, so hopefully I can see these. But what I want to do today is very briefly give you an overview of uh, the role that we see ourselves at the health service providing for students. Uh, one simple analogy is to say that we really look at the health service as providing the primary care physicians for students while they're at Dartmouth. Uh, as a result, uh, we gather information on students before they even come, put it into their ele electrical me medical record, which we keep up throughout their college years, and that can become a valuable resource for them as far as vaccination records and so forth in the future. We also look at it ourselves as the place where we can uh, refer students to the resources that are not only at the health service, but also in the community, especially at the medical center. But one thing that we really have an uh, important role, and it sometimes can be difficult because we're embedded within the college, is that we realize one of the primary responsibilities we have is to maintain the student's confidentiality concerning his or her uh, medical issues. And I think we do a very good job of that, uh, although we are trying to partnership with not only the student but with others in the uh, college community. Now I should say, just so you'll have an overview, uh, the medical services at, uh, at, at Dartmouth uh, include medical services and the psychological services all within the same, under the same roof. That's different at some schools. We also have uh, athletic medicine that reports in to the health service. Uh, the athletic trainers report into the health service, which is something that we like uh, because medical decisions are therefore made by medical uh, people as opposed to some places that report into the athletic director. We also have a health resource or health education department uh, that uh, can educate students about their health now and also to stay healthy in the future. One thing I should mention, we also have an infirmary that you know is somewhat of a, uh, a lost uh, resource in many schools. Uh, we have uh, about a 10 bed infirmary that we can use with very low threshold to have students with medical or psychological problems uh, that need to be hospitalized for short periods of time. Now, uh, as far as partnering with students, I think the, the number one goal we have is trying to help support students while they're at Dartmouth medically and psychologically so they can get the most out of their in-classroom and out-of-classroom experience. Uh, however, having said that, I always think of the first line of the tale of two cities. It's the best of times and it's the worst of times. And I think that not only applies to Paris, but also to college. And I think sometimes at these gatherings, we always mention all the wonderful times. And there are certainly many that the students have. But it really doesn't surprise me when you take a bunch of very talented, academically ambitious students, put them in with a lot of other students, uh, push them to become not just very good students, but great students, throw in 102 things that they can do out of the classroom, uh, throw in economic turndowns, uh, relationship problems, loneliness, and so forth. You know, it's not surprising that almost all students have some bumps in the road somewhere along the line. Uh, I think that's where Dartmouth size can come in handy. We're big enough and wealthy enough to have a lot of resources. I tell students, look, our health service is well-funded. We should be able to provide good medical services for you, and if we're not, you know, let me know. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we're small enough that most of the people you've heard talk today have worked together, know each other. Uh, we, we have good relationships with faculty, coaches, staff, as well as the deans. And as a result, it's a little bit easier for us to hopefully recognize when students need some help and to get those resources to the student. Uh, goal number two is one of the things that we uh, want to help students do while they're here is to recognize some medical and psychological issues that they may have and also to help them to create some healthy lifestyles that's going to allow them to lead a healthy life into the future. So our health education department, you know, really tries to educate students. And as a matter of fact, every visit we see for a student, you know, we try to mention to them uh, ways that they can lead a healthy lifestyle. Uh, because we realize the goal is not just to make it through four years of Dartmouth, but to live a, a long and healthy life. The third goal, we, we, you know, often articulate to ourselves, and I haven't discussed this a lot with uh, uh, parents are students, but I think it's important. And we really feel at the health service that we're part of the liberal arts education. I think it's important for students to not only recognize when they need medical help, 
but what are the skills they need to identify the resources and to actually be able to get that medical help? And let's face it, up until now, most of these students haven't had to do this. You in the audience, you know, told them when their appointments were for the dentist or the doctor, picked them up at school and took them to the appointment. Here, they, they have to uh, start to uh, make the appointments themselves. And as you all know, that can be frustrating. You know, well, I can't find an appointment that will exactly fit my schedule. And the reason why I think this is becoming more and more of an important skill is that unlike my generation and maybe your generation, uh, where, you know, we tended to take a job and stay there for a long time. We had the same barber. We had the same uh, hairdresser. We had the same uh, uh, doctor. These students are going to have many different jobs. They're going to move around. And every time they do that, they not only have to find a new bank and so forth, they have to find um, medical resources. And that can be very difficult. So I think it's very important for students to start to have to do that while on, you know, here on campus and learn how to do that later on. All right. Uh, I think I skipped one here. Let me just see this. Well, you're probably wondering where do parents fit into this. You've already been compared to helicopters, stealth bombers, and so forth. I'm going to take one other analogy in a second, but it's a tricky business. Uh, I say this from the perspective of having three kids that have all graduated from college uh, over the last decade. And my wife and I, our kids are now the youngest 27, the oldest 33. We live by one saying, you're only as happy as your most unhappy child. And you know, it doesn't change, believe me. So, uh, I've been trying to, de I'm trying to decide how to explain what I think relationships parents have. And I think that uh, a politically correct way to say this is that the relationships you have with your daughter and sons, like ours, are always in a stage of evolvement. And I don't know where your relationships are in this evolution. But I'm sure it's changing, and they're all different. And it's amazing how big a spectrum this is. It's already been alluded to with uh, emails and the advent of this little simple-looking device, the cell phone, how there are some students that talk to their parents multiple times a day, and many of them don't make any decisions, large, moderate, or small, without getting input from their parents, which for that relationship, that's great. At the other end of the spectrum, there are students that come to college who want to be very independent. And those parents of those students sit next to the telephone and look at it every night and say, do you think he'll call tonight? If he doesn't call by 9 o'clock, we're driving up there. Uh, well, let's wait for one more day and we'll see. And, you know, all of our relationships are somewhere on that spectrum. Now, I'm not going to try to micromanage your relationship with your, your students, but I, I, one word of advice I would give is uh, I, I think the relationship is similar to uh, training wheels on a bicycle. I was thinking this, is, uh, this may work. Give it a try. It's better than being called a stealth bomber anyways. Is I remember back when I was riding my four-wheeler. Anybody have a bicycle that had the training wheels on it? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. And I remember it dawned on me at some point, you know, I was able to tool around pretty effectively my neighborhood with these four-wheelers. But for me to go to the other side of town to kind of play baseball over there or to meet some other people, I, I needed to get to a two-wheeler where I could really go some distances. Um, but it was a lot easier with those four wheels on. And, and I eventually took the, four, the wheels off, had a couple of falls, had some scrapes, but pretty soon learned how to ride on my own. And when I look back, it's, I think parents are similar to that. We, you know, we've provided those two-wheel stability, uh, four-wheel stability for a long time for our students. And it's very difficult for the student and for the parents to take those training wheels off and let the student ride on their own. They're going to have some falls. They're going to have some bumps. Um, the other thing I would just mention that always has amazed me, I've been at Dartmouth a long time, is that these incredibly talented, successful students come to school and when I talk to some parents, I think in the back of their minds, they just wonder, do you think he or she can make it without me? And I think that's a very common feeling, especially first year. Students are going to do fine. And the overwhelming students, yeah, will, unfortunately or fortunately, I think fortunately, make it without you. But it is an evolution of this relationship. And I think it's very difficult for some parents to understand that. 
And so as a result, uh, what I would suggest is that uh, if you have concerns, if you have questions, if you have uh, uh, suggestions of how we should uh, you know, interact with a student, don't hesitate to call any of us. And when I say us, I mean everybody you've talk, heard from today or on campus, but specifically I'm going to talk about the health service uh, providers, the psychologists and the medical people. We're more than happy to talk to you, to hear your input, to ask, uh, your questions and your concerns. Now we may not be able to tell you specific medical information without getting permission from your student, uh, from your uh, sons or daughters. I will say this parenthetically, however, almost all students will agree to let us talk to parents. But we do want to make sure we have that permission because we really are valuing the student's uh, you know, medical confidentiality. But what we can do, even if we don't have the ability to tell you specific medical issues, you know, we can follow up on the input that you give us, and I promise we will. You know, as I say, this is a relatively small place, and so it's easy to kind of follow up uh, when you have some concerns. So, you know, it is the best of times, it's the worst of times, but it'll end up being the best of times. As you see, as I see students mature, it always is amazing to me to see these students that all are very talented when they come in, but some of them are more secure socially and uh, can interact uh, better than others. By the time they're third or fourth year students, it's amazing how much maturity has occurred. So I hope the rest of the day goes well. Uh, great baseball doubleheader at a new park, you know, right down the street. You should definitely get on and catch a few innings because I think you'll enjoy it. And uh, if there are any questions, don't hesitate to contact me by email. I, I probably will be around for a while afterwards, but, uh, you know, welcome to Hanover. And thanks for bringing the uh, warm weather.